Hello and welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and on today's episode we've got a very special virtual episode with the fantastic writer of The Weaver and the Witch Queen, Genevieve Gornacek. Hey Genevieve, how's it going? Good, how are you? Very well, very well. You caught us both, uh, me not as early in the morning but you very <laughs> early. <laughs> the coffee hasn't quite hit yet but I'm going to do my best. Okay, okay. <laughs> so what's your... Um, more like morning routine like do you start writing quite early as well or I actually get up and go running Ah, first thing in the morning because before I can think about it too much because (laughs) if I put it off later in the day I'm like I'm not gonna go so I usually get up run and then come home and write once my once my zoomies are out let's say (laughs) (laughs) and you can really get a session of writing in so right Yeah. yeah no that that makes sense that makes sense I know um, it seems to be authors are either early birds or night owls and never the twain shall meet kind of yep, thing. Yep, yep. I, uh, I definitely was a night owl uh, for most of my life. And then when I was in college, I started working at a coffee shop and that kind of just rewired my brain to be yes. a morning person, like pretty much against my will. But <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's who I am now. <laughs> Gotta miss that um free coffee as well. That's a great thing about working in a coffee shop, right? Really miss the free coffee. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I I used to have a coffee shop job when I was a student. So yeah, I, oh my gosh, two three free cups of coffee a day. You get yep. your free sandwich. Oh yeah, yes, yes, it was amazing. <laughs> oh god, yeah. That's the only thing I miss <laughs> about being a student is free stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was that was nice. <laughs> yeah, that was that. It was a nice period um but yeah so on on to uh why we're here today so to talk about your second book with titan uh which is just fantastic absolutely adored it i'm so happy that i get to chat to you today thank you um so what can you tell anyone out there about the weaver and the witch queen who may not have come across your works before because obviously you've had another fantastic book with titan prior to this so yeah what what can you tell everyone out there about this one so uh, The Weaver and the Witch Queen is a historical fantasy reimagining of the origin story of Gunhild, Mother of Kings, who was a 10th century queen of Norway. Um, and the, the historical sources tend to vilify her due to the villainous things that she does. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's it's a story about uh basically while I was reading these these you know sources I was like you know what this woman needs she needs two best friends so I gave her two best friends and then one of them gets kidnapped and they have to go on an adventure uh, to save her although there is you know a section of the adventure where they're just in the winter waiting to go <laughs> on the adventure so spoiler alert <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there's some downtime in Norway so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um what is it that's kind of so intriguing about rewriting that kind of villainous character well so she's not like it's interesting because she's not quite a villain yet mm. yes and uh the story actually ends before we see her become the person that she is later in her life in the stories uh which the stories about her are from uh largely from iceland and like there are some norwegian sources that are like a little bit more contemporary but the icelandic sources are more fun and in the medieval ice exactly yeah yep. and in the medieval icelandic family sagas um they like the characters really come out they're not just histories um a lot of the times these characters do have like personalities and passions um that even though the authors of these stories back then were very understated <laughs> they, they loved a good understatement um Gun- Gunhild was one of those characters that just like popped off the page for me I mean here was a woman who like argued with her husband the king publicly like and and just like you supposedly used magic and just you she was someone that you definitely wanted as a friend and not as an enemy so when I was reading these stories the first time I was like oh man she's so cool <laughs> so after my first novel The Witch's Heart when my uh American publisher was like so what's next do you want to redeem another like vilified figure? And I'm like, I want to write about another vilified figure. I don't know if I want to redeem her though. Yeah, um, 
it's yeah. quite interesting because you you obviously say um about how I suppose the story ends without too many spoilers with a very much okay so what could happen next and you start kind of your mind starts racing about okay how yeah. did you get from from here to to here which is very interesting so I, I really hope to follow it up with more one day uh yeah. but we'll see if that ever happens I was told uh, it had to be in a nice one 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 book in one package uh so there was a lot that got left out and a lot more that could happen so okay. fingers fingers crossed <laughs> I mean I would buy it if you wrote <laughs> you there, there's going to be some sales if you come back <laughs> thanks <laughs> um so talking about the characters is it the characters that kind of come to you first is it like I have to write about this person or is it is it more about the world or a combo of both it's it's mostly the, just the characters like I'm I'm a big character reader and I'm a big character writer so the first couple of drafts of Weaver because I'm also what the kids call a pantser I write by the seat of my pants I have yeah. no idea what's going to happen yeah. um and for both of my books I kind of had the bones of what was going to happen because it is what is said to have happened in the histories and the legends and stuff but to kind of like fit my own story kind of around that um I really need to connect to the characters first and being a pantser it takes me a few drafts sometimes to really make that connection and a lot of the times it's one character like like my understanding of one character changes and then the whole story changes um in the case of Weaver it was Eric Bloodaxe my understanding of my connection with this particular character was what was like holding back so much of the story. Yes. Um, because I was using a translation of one of the sources that kind of paints him unfavorably. But if you read the actual sentence in Old Norse, it is quite different than the translation I was using. Oh. I was like, okay, so this character has gone from, I don't know if I should spoil it. I don't know if I should be specific. Um. Uh... That's, uh, yeah, that's a genuine. I know. I know. <laughs> um, well, like Eric Bloodaxe historically kills at least two of his brothers. I think three actually. But in, in Weaver, he's already killed two of them. Yes. And one of them in particular haunts him, not just like mentally, but also like somebody is actually haunting him. Like a, a, li a living person yes. uh, is haunting him. <laughs> uh, and and in, in, in terms of like the, this killing that he commits against his brother in this translation I was using, it said that he decided to go kill his brother and his father gave his approval. Then I switched to a different translation because the first one I was like, I don't want to connect with that guy. Like that's icky. Yeah. You know, I don't want to get closer to that. Um, and the second translation I, I, I just was flipping through. It says Eric blood went to go kill his brother at his father's instruction. And I was like, that's different like regardless of whether or not like which one is true mm -hmm. one of these is a more engaging character to yes. me like mm -hmm. uh and then if you actually like look at the old norse which i did uh, eventually when i found it it did there it is very much open to interpretation yes. um one word in particular that i'm trying to like pin down it's like okay like but i i still believe the second translation and it really did influence uh this this character and how i wrote him so and it, it sounds as if the research process for this in particular was just obviously, I mean, you could potentially lose yourself in the research. There's so many different ways of interpreting it. <laughs> I definitely did. Um, <laughs> for a while, I, it took me so long to 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 accept that I could just take the story into my own hands, that, I, that I, it's so hard for me to know when to stop researching and to start actually just writing my own story because I am so afraid of getting things wrong or like, you know, uh, learning something. And I have a whole stack of books here to read. And I know that I'm going to learn something <laughs> in this my the next stage of my research <laughs> process that's going to make me go, oh man, I did all these things wrong in The Weaver and the Witch Queen and The Witch's Heart. Um, but like, if I waited to publish the perfect book, I would never publish. So like, yeah yeah that, that struggle <laughs> that yeah I, yeah I can imagine if you if you oh if I just research this and if I just go here and yeah mm -hmm. that that takes over yep, but. yep. <laughs> so we have to um talk about how uh three is definitely the magic number for you because obviously in the witch's heart we had the three children Yep. Uh, here we have the two sisters and their best friends so what do you find particularly interesting about writing that kind of 
three person dynamic I know obviously it's two POVs but you definitely have the that yeah. third character present so right um so three and nine at like the multiple of three yeah. <laughs> uh, are very very important numbers in Nordic mythology and uh, that just is something that keeps coming up like both in the myths and in the the Icelandic sagas you know like oh these nine women on horseback are going to kill this guy and like oh uh, the nine everything's nines yeah. and threes <laughs> um and that kind of lent itself very well to like me and my understanding of the world just because like I have been lucky enough to be like the third musketeer in many like <laughs> friend groups um I always just tend to fall into threes and I don't know why so it was a very it was a very natural dynamic to write um Good Hill Odney and Signy. yes yeah I mean there's such a wonderful kind of relationship between all three um was there any kind of when you were writing them was there any anyone you were kind of loosely basing them off either kind of real people or or people you've come across in other kind of fictional worlds no they they I didn't uh consciously base them off yeah. anybody they just kind of came to me the way that they were <laughs> yeah <laughs> they just they feel like very flesh and bone they they feel very kind of real which is Thank which you. is a, a testament to your writing I think with with both this and the the witch's heart you there's a there's a pace and that you feel kind of even even if there isn't a big battle scene or something happening right. there's still like a pace to it right which I think is really really important so do you do you find it kind of um your writing style has it changed between books do you kind of keep the same kind of do you write in order do you kind of write bits as and when you're kind of in that mood to I'm going to do the the battle scene now I'm going to do this scene now so I uh, my problem is that because of the way that I write um if I skipped around <laughs> to the stuff that I wanted to write I would never write what's in the middle Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I I have a vague idea of how I want things to end most of the time and the rest of the book is just working my way there. And right. so if I just write the end, I'm never going to have any motivation to fill in uh, the middle. And I also just being like a very, very linear writer, um, I like if I get halfway through writing the book and then I'm like, oh, this one big thing at the beginning needs to change. And then all of this other stuff is going to change and then we're going to get to where we're going. I have to go back and make those changes right then. I can't just like, okay, put a marker here and be like, remember, we're changing this going forward. Like I actually have to go back and like do the work. So my process takes a while and it definitely uh, is different than the, like writing The Weaver and the Witch Queen, which was under contract, was much different than writing The Witch's Heart, which I wrote 12 years ago in college and then sat on for seven years. So I... It, it, I've I've heard a lot of this is really different than the witch's heart. It's like, yes, I <laughs> I I wrote the witch's heart when I was a depressed student, like sitting in my dorm room at three a.m. writing this book for Nano Rimo in twenty eleven. Like literally, like they, they yes, the books could not be more different. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> very very different. Same person, but also different. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It's it's quite interesting because we um last week we had Samantha Shannon in to yeah. sign her lovely uh, anniversary edition of the Bone Season, yes. and obviously writing something over ten years ago and then coming back to kind of revisit it. I mean, it's it must be very difficult to to almost revisit who you were like as a yeah. twenty twenty one year old getting your book deal to to now. Yeah, um, and yeah, yeah. I mean, even, even, I'm very glad because I did write The Witch's Heart when I was 21, but I did tweak it over the years yes. uh, before. And then I had to rewrite almost half of it uh, for publication. So, uh, but the first half of The Witch's Heart basically is unchanged. Right. And um, uh, that's like a time capsule. <laughs> and I would be so lucky to be Samantha Shannon 10 years from now and get to go back and revisit it. Uh, but that is something that I... Like I'm, I'm super excited for her. Um, I haven't watched your interview with her yet, but I mean, I do have the new edition of the Bone Season sitting right here, and I can't wait to read it. Um, 
but like man like that's goals right to be able to be like this was my successful book that I wrote when I was very young yes I'm gonna revise it now like I was like that's the dream because I have such a problem letting go (laughs) that's probably the (laughs) hardest part of my process is being like okay here it is and I can't make any more changes (laughs) (laughs) Do you also then, um, I know obviously a few authors I know just do not read reviews, good or bad. They just don't want to know because then they start kind of, oh, I should have changed this or I should have. Are are you that way inclined as well? Or like no reviews? (laughs) No, I I am. I am. I look, but I I don't say like, I don't say anything publicly (laughs) about anything just because like, Oh my gosh. I know like I'm grateful to anybody who reads it, regardless of what they think, regardless of what they post. Like the fact that people are even picking up my work is like beyond my wildest dream. So far be it from me to criticize somebody for giving their honest opinion. Um, but people can be mean. And that that is why I think that authors shouldn't read reviews. Yeah. Uh do as do as I say, not as I do. Yes. Um but it's also very nice being tagged in the good ones right like on places like instagram where people are just usually very very kind like instagram is my like happy place (gasps) yes but um i i did eventually for the witch's heart just because i i was so new i i didn't know what to do with like this information that i was finding that people were saying about me i did have a friend actually screen them uh, and just be like, I'm like, just tell me, tell me the good ones yes. and tell me if there's anything that people are criticizing over and over and over, because that gives me a better idea, mm-hmm. you know, cause sometimes it's just one person's opinion and it's totally off the wall. And then the next person contradicts their opinion with something <laughs> yeah, totally yeah. different. And so that's why like, like reading, especially like reading the bad reviews, like doesn't, doesn't help you at all. Uh, unless like I said like my friend was taking almost like uh, like she was like okay here's our sample here are some (laughs) things that people are saying repeatedly that maybe you could take to heart and work on Mm. Um, but no good it's going to come of just making yourself feel bad and then feeling the urge to rant about it online which like we have seen this over and over recently with authors and bad behavior surrounding reviews it's like people are reading your work like just just let it go yes yeah if you know yeah people people are picking it up and yeah it's, it, you know people are discussing it and of course obviously people are going to have different opinions but right yeah it's it's I suppose it's very tricky obviously especially we deal with a lot of the the fandoms and stuff at Forbidden Planet which yeah. is, which is great to right. see those fans yes. out in force but if they dislike oh <laughs> yeah no. yeah and and I have I have been in fandoms like my entire life it's like I know I was prepared for this I wrote fan fiction on fanfiction.net like I thought that I was emotionally read I know I was there Gandalf like (laughs) like, I thought I was ready (laughs) do you still write fan fiction no I mean (laughs) not that there's anything wrong with writing fan fiction I, I, I not at all um however I would say that what I'm doing now is also a form of fan fiction, you know, like the Nordic myths, historical fantasy, there are parameters to the world. I can change them a little bit there, but there are some pre-established things that I have to keep in mind when I'm writing. Mm-hmm. So t- yes. a type of fan fiction. I think a lot of retellings qualify as fan fiction personally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of authors I've spoken to have kind of started off um either publicly or not publicly <laughs> writing uh fan fiction so yeah it it, it makes sense makes yeah sense. So, yeah um so um we have to kind of touch on the very I suppose the different forms of love in the book and the relationships mm-hmm. so you've obviously okay. got a very complicated sibling relationship you've got kind of the found family relationship you have got a bit of a a love story and stuff as as well in there um how important is are those things especially I think found family seems to be such a a heartwarming thing to see in fantasy these days so how important is that for you to kind of include those things the found family thing just kind of came together uh it wasn't <laughs> I, I didn't sit down and be like I'm gonna write a found family story <laughs> um but I wanted to really just just so much of like what was driving me to write this book was 
the ways in which we don't get to see the relationships between women in the historical sources. We don't have a lot of examples of women talking to each other um, about, uh, there's a couple times they talk to each other, but a lot of the times it's about men and what the men are doing and, and all this stuff. So I wanted to give these women from this time period, like the, the, the inner lives that they deserved, like the relationships and um, the friendships and uh, that was really my goal just to be like okay like this is really cool that the guys are over here hitting each other with swords <laughs> um but like what about the other half of the population <laughs> like so um yeah yeah and they 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 feel they are as important to the story they are moving things forward these right. you know, three kind of um central female characters so right. it's it's great that you yeah you're you're not discounting the men but these yeah. these women are as important and they are doing amazingly kind of brave things and almost almost kind of I suppose women out of time in a right. way um yeah. which are oh, fantastic to read and we also have to touch on I this is always like a, a tick in my book anyone who mentions anything to do with women's hormones periods anything like that as <laughs> Because otherwise it's just a mystery and it doesn't actually happen. <laughs> right, right. And and again, half the population has these 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 issues um and has periods. And it's like, why is it such like a taboo? Why is it hardly ever mentioned in fantasy, especially mm. when these people are going on adventures? It's like wh- I have questions. Like, yeah. Especially especially for people like who do have like you know like Odney in the book have these horrible menstrual cycles yes. that like like affect their life significantly mm-hmm. and you know you could say like oh, I don't know what periods had to do with the story it's like they were there so yes. I wrote them it's like if, if you can handle women sending out their their spirits as animals to like yes. go cause trouble but you can't suspend your disbelief for like periods existing and being <laughs> mentioned like I don't I don't know what to tell you buddy yeah <laughs> yeah it was yeah way way before ibuprofen was a thing <laughs> so, right just having, having to deal yeah <laughs> so, yep. yeah yeah it, it's it's just a great thing when you kind of I don't know it makes the characters all that more realistic that these right. things aren't aren't just being like glossed over and if you're following a character for months years in a story surely it's gonna come up <laughs> yeah yeah you right. would um you also touched on there obviously the the magic system which is fantastic so obviously we we have witches and obviously the ability to kind of send their spirit but it also i suppose makes their body prone then to to attack um right so yeah where did where did the idea for is that again from kind of your research and um reading up it was it was very much inspired by research, but um, the sagas take a very loose view of magic. Uh, there really aren't any rules. It's just like this person summoned a blizzard, and then they filled the fjord with fish, and then they did this and that and this and that, with no like instructions on like how, mm. like how did how did they carve runes? Did they chant? Did they do, you know like it? Did you... So I, I basically had to come up with some guidelines for how the magic system was going to work. Um, but it was definitely inspired by different episodes um, from the medieval Icelandic family sagas, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I always, I do always wonder, I think, I don't know whether it's my gaming brain, like, how how did this thing get here? And, and you know, how does this work? Yeah. But right. yeah, it, it does, it fits in with that kind of universe. I, yeah, I like the idea of kind of taking over various animals. So, yeah. 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 If you had to send your spirit into your into an animal for the day, where would you go? Oh, probably a bird. Some kind of bird. Yeah. 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 I saw I saw your cat before. You could always do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, they're I'm sorry if you can hear the jingling. They're doing their morning their morning uh battle. Uh <laughs> the morning brawl. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 gotta be done. It's gotta be yeah. done. Uh if you get any multiples of cats, they must yes. fight. So. <laughs> um so coming coming to towards the end of our interview today um what are you working on next that is a good question <laughs> and i don't have the answer unfortunately 
Hot damn. <laughs> Sorry. So, something great. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see what they want next from me. Okay. Interesting. And what are you currently reading, watching, and if you game, what are you currently playing? Uh, I am in between books right now. Sorry. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, uh, I just got back from, from traveling uh, around Northern Europe and I read a lot while I was there, but I, I've come back and I've kind of been like, brain needs rest. Um, <laughs> but I've been working my way through Star Trek DS9. Uh, it is my mission to like go back and watch all of Star Trek since the beginning. So I'm on season six of Deep Space Nine and it's, I just, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. this, it, it was something I was thinking about doing because I've I've watched some of the newer Star Trek stuff but I'm not as familiar with the many <laughs> the many other seasons before so yeah that, there's a lot yeah there's a lot. I, I I really like yeah I really like Lower Decks as well which is one of the newer ones that I don't know if you've watched it at all but it I, is a I haven't no but I know um some of the guys who work for us, we designed some lower deck stuff. So if you're ever that's in the so UK, awesome. we're going to give you a free bundle of lower decks. Oh, we have some t-shirts so nice. and some like travel card holders. And stuff. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, Thank definitely you. come to the UK. Come get free yes. shirts. <laughs> yes. I hope to um, one day. Yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe one day. I mean, we do... Um, I'm always trying to hustle people to come to Comic Con because we do all the book events at Comic Con. So okay. we we have um two uh London based Comic Cons that happen in kind of May and October. Nice and um loads of kind of book events and stuff, which is super fun. And That's awesome. um for this October, we got the Critical Role guys coming over. <laughs> That's so cool. So yeah, this this is gonna be uh yeah, it's gonna be crazy. It'll be super fun. But That's so yeah, exciting. Those those cues are gonna be Yeah. Yep. <laughs> massive. They I think they've already sold out like uh one of the arenas here, like Wembley Arena or something. Oh my gosh. They're doing like a pre-show event. So wow. That's crazy. Yeah. D and D D and D is legitimate now, folks. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my god. I was just that was another thing as well. I was just thinking that this you could almost make a D and D campaign out out of either of your books. So I've thought about it. I thought yeah. about it, but I I I don't know. Being a DM sounds pretty complicated. I'm I'm still like a newer D and D player. I don't know all of the ins and outs of the okay. game. I started a few years ago, um, but I don't play often enough to be consistent like and consistently learning um but yeah i have some cool campaign ideas i'm not just not sure how to make them into campaigns you'll get there yeah <laughs> i i have yes. every 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 faith you <laughs> thank you thanks so much no problem but yeah thank you so much for joining us today um as you said off camera we have uh book plates so for uh customers at home there are signed copies of the weaver and the witch queen in all nine of our stores currently and on mail order and we do ship internationally as well so for our, our european brethren and so <laughs> they could also get signed copies um but yeah thank you so much genevieve for joining me today and um yeah hopefully see you again soon yeah thanks for having me bye bye if you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.